We are in Judges chapter 3 tonight, and as you've noticed, now there's a little bit of a transition. Judges 1 and 2 is kind of the, the precursors to getting into all the rest of the stories of the book of the Judges. Judges 1, we kind of got the review of Joshua, because we, you know, we're, we're going in order here. We just finished the book of Joshua in our Bible study, and kind of makes sense to trans transition into the book of Judges. Judges chapter 1 gives us that recap of pretty much a lot of the book of Joshua, how God got their victories for them and, and made all, won all these battles while Joshua was alive. And then in chapter 2, we kind of got the set the precedent for what the rest of the book of Judges is going to be about. And the overall theme throughout the book of Judges is that you're going to have a man of God that's, that rises up, that God raises up to deliver his people from being oppressed. And then the, while that judge is in charge, while they're being led by a strong leader, things are going great. And then as soon as that leader dies, he's kind of out of the picture. Then they just get off into sin. They start worshiping other gods and God has to bring them into bondage. And they go and start serving other kings from other lands as a punishment, as judgment for straying away from the Lord their God. And this happens over and over and over again. And in chapter 3, we're just getting started. We start to see a couple of men that God raises up and the pattern starts right away. So let's jump in here in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Now, last week I touched on this, and we see how awesome God is. He's able to make um, good out of bad situations. He's able to, to use what people do for his own will and his own benefit all the time. Now, I, I, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but last week I was covering the subject of how, you know, we have choices to make. We have a will of our own that God has given to us. We can choose to do good or to do evil. God gives us instruction. God tells us what his will is, but he leaves it up to us whether or not we're going to follow that will. And what he's done here and, and, and what he's done for the children of Israel, he told them, hey, if you're with me, if you listen to what I say, if you do what I do, I will, you know, all your enemies will flee from you. You'll have this land. I'll defeat all of your enemies. I'll fight all of your battles for you. Now, on a large sense, he did that for the most part. But he did that as much as the children of Israel were willing to obey him and follow him. We've already gone through the book of Joshua. There's, many, there's, there's certain instances where they failed, where their faith lacked, where they thought, oh, no, we can't, we can't take over this city because they've got chariots. Or, you know, they come up with these other excuses, even though God has been winning their battles for them. So as a result of them not completely trusting in the Lord in every battle, in every situation, they, the heathen was, were not completely driven away from them. In addition to them making that league, with the heathen where they, where they did not, uh, they were not able to because they vowed uh, that they wouldn't uh, harm them. There was, there was the heathen left in the land for that reason as well. But what we see here now is that God's saying, okay, well, they didn't listen to me, but here's what's going to happen now with these people. I'm going to use them to test my people to prove them. So now that these people are remaining, God's saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them to try to test my people to see, are they really going to listen to me or not? That's kind of this new purpose for, these, for the heathen of the land to be there. And he also mentions um, only the generations of the children of Israel, in verse number two, might know to teach them war at the least, such as before knew nothing thereof. And then he names the, these five lords of the Philistines, verse number three, says, namely five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And I think it's interesting too, he brings up that these people didn't know war. And the people that he's going to see, well, are they, you know, these people that were in the battle, in the war, you know, they went through their battles, their struggles, their hardships, their, their hard times, and they relied on God for that. 
And it's easier to rely on God when you're going through battles, when you're going through difficulties, when you have struggles in your life. That's typically when most people will look to God and say, God, help me. Right? God often will humble people for that purpose. That's the reason why God brings other nations upon the children of Israel is to humble them, to bring them back low again when they stray away. He says, okay, you're getting a little bit too lifted up in your own pride. I need to bring you back down or not so you'll seek me, so that you'll look for me. And that's why these, these now we see why these heathen are left there to test them because now they're going to be left with more battles and more wars to fight. And oftentimes when people don't have to sacrifice, when they don't have to go through battles and struggles, they have a tendency to take things for granted and then kind of lose their way, right? We see this even throughout history when you have generations of people whose you know, forefathers had a lot of work, had a lot of struggles, had a lot of battles, didn't have things just handed to them on a silver platter, but they had to work hard. And then the next generation comes up and they learn from their parents how to work hard and they, they learn that ethic and, and they kind of grow up working hard also, but they're reaping also the blessing from the previous generation of them working hard. And then you get to that third generation who oftentimes will just kind of have everything given to them because now they're reaping from what their predecessors have sown and, and things are going much better from them from all the hard work. And they have a tendency then to kind of start expecting things, having that spoiled brat type of an attitude or mentality. And once you get into that mindset and that philosophy or way of thinking, then uh, it's going to bring trouble because that usually just people end up getting lifted up with pride. They think we've got everything. Who needs God? and they go into sin. And it's just this cycle, and it, and it seems to repeat over and over and over again. And sometimes people need to go through those battles or those wars. Now, obviously, we're reading about physical wars, like actual warfare and battle in this story, but you can apply that to your own spiritual battles and things that you fight in life. I think those are some of the key things we could learn from passages like this. But let's keep reading here. Look at verse number Five, the Bible reads, And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. It lists every single nation that was supposed to be destroyed from before the children of Israel. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. These were all listed way back in the book of Moses when they were going into the promised land, that these were the people of the land of Canaan that God was bringing judgment against, that God said, you know, they need to be utterly destroyed and, and wiped out. And they didn't do it to even one of the nations. Every single one of them remained. Now, they did have a lot of battles where they did execute that judgment in particular cities throughout, you know, as they were going through the land. But apparently they just didn't finish the job in the entire, uh, in the entire land, an entire nation. Verse number six, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. And I, I, I mentioned this briefly, but I covered this back in the book of Joshua also, that this was part of the law, God's law saying not to go and join yourself unto the heathen of the land by making marriages and giving your daughters to them. And basically what you do is you're, you're integrating your families and just mixing in, not because, it's, not because God's a racist and he cares about like, their, the color of their skin or anything like that. That's not why God was giving this law of not mingling in with the heathen. But it has more to do with, it has everything to do with what they believed because they didn't follow the Lord their God. And the whole purpose is that, hey, if you're going to start giving your daughters to their sons, they're going to start following their gods, the gods of the land around them. And that's evident because the scripture teaches that if anyone wanted to join themselves to be part of Israel, they could have. From any foreign land, from anywhere else, they could have went and joined to become part of Israel according to God's law. It had nothing to do with where they were born, what they looked like. It has to do every single time from Genesis to Revelation about what you believe. That's why the Bible says he is not a Jew which is a Jew outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. God's people have been a people of believers. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. 
Romans 4 explains that perfectly. It has nothing to do with your nationality or orange or, or <laughs> orange origin. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, with what you believe. That's it. Very simple. It's not just a New Testament teaching. It's all throughout Scripture. But let's keep reading here. And these people, you know, there's uh, the, the God haters that hate the Bible always want to bring up these examples of, well, how could God say, you know, these people deserve to, uh, to be put to death or whatever. You know, there's women and children and everything. And yeah, you know what? God did bring that judgment upon these nations. But the reason is because of how wicked they had become. And actually, keep your, keep your place here. Let's turn back real quickly to Leviticus chapter number 20. What we find in Leviticus chapters 18, 19, and 20 are a lot of God's laws that are capital crimes. The crimes that, that according to God, the righteous judgment on these crimes is they need to be put to death. This is the word of God. And God hasn't changed his mind about how grievous certain sins are. It doesn't matter what the culture says. It doesn't matter what year it is. God's attitude has not changed in all of eternity. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when the Bible covers all manner of sin... You know, throughout history, certain things become acceptable and others don't. Even to this day, there's certain sins that people commit that would be like, oh, yeah, that's horrible. Those people ought to be put to death. I know there's some people that don't believe in death penalty at all, but there's still a large portion of society today that would still even say, yes, that person should be put to death. For example, if you have someone who's just this serial child molester, Right? I mean, someone who's just defiling children. I mean, I would, I would venture to say the majority of people in the United States would say, you know what? Yeah, that person probably ought to be put to death. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any statistics backing me up on that, but I, you know, just through talking to people and seeing what people put just out online, I, I'd be pretty safe to say that, that that's a pretty grievous, wicked sin. Or like people like John Wayne Gacy, right? I don't think there's that many people have a hard time saying, yeah, they ought to be put to death. So there is still a sentiment of, of that level of righteousness. But what happens is, and what's happened in our society especially, is that certain sins have been either for, for, for many different reasons. I'm not getting all the different reasons. But different sins start to become more acceptable. And, and the wicked influences want to, to get their agenda across to make it normalized as if perverted behavior is not really that bad and that it really is just a choice and that they're not perverts but that they're just born that way or whatever excuse they want to come up with as to why something isn't wicked they'll they, they try to spin that uh their their propaganda into making you think that it's not that big of a deal and they use today they're using movies and music and, and movie stars and and all of this stuff to try to convince you that this stuff isn't that bad but let's look in leviticus chapter 20. the bible says in verse number let, i mean there's a whole we're not going to read through all of all of um chapter 20 but look at verse number just to give you an idea of what's going on here, what it's talking about. Look at verse number 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. God hasn't changed his mind 
on how wicked a sin adultery is. Just because we live in a society today where maybe 50% of marriages are ending in divorce and a large portion of those divorces are a result of adultery, just because people are doing it a lot doesn't make it any less wicked or grievous and it doesn't change God's mind on what the punishment ought to be. God hasn't changed his mind. And people say, oh, what about the woman taken in adultery? And Jesus said, let him, it was without sin, first cast a stone at her. Yeah, you know what? Read that passage in context and understand that the people that were trying to do that, they're trying to trip Jesus up in his words. They're trying to get him to be arrested for usurping the authority of the Roman government that was over them at the time because the Jews did not have the authority by the Roman government to execute someone or to put them to death according to the law. So if Jesus would have said, yep, put her to death, then he would have been guilty and that's not the purpose he came to this earth anyways. And besides, Jesus didn't come to be the judge the first time he came to this earth. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. That was his job, that was his mission, that was his duty. So he answered wisely in that situation. He didn't say she's not worthy of death. That's not what he said. In fact, if you actually take him literally, he said, go ahead and stone her. I mean, that's what he said. Now, obviously, he said it wisely. I know that he said that with the intent that they wouldn't carry out that judgment. Okay? And that's a whole Bible study in and of itself. But read it in context and understand what's going on and why he answered the way he did. God's law hasn't changed. Well, it's changed in certain areas in, in the ceremonial Levitical priesthood aspect of it. Everywhere where the Bible says, and especially in the book of Hebrews and other places in the New Testament, where there's specific changes, yes, we don't offer up animal sacrifices anymore. Yes, the dietary restrictions have been listed, lifted. But if it doesn't say that it's changed, then guess what? It hasn't changed. And God's views about right and wrong, I mean, this is morality we're talking about committing adultery. This wasn't just something specific to the Levitical priesthood. This is just about right and wrong and how God feels about it. If God felt that it deserved the death penalty back then, he believes the same way now. Let's keep reading. Verse number 11, And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man, and here we go. This is the one that everyone has a problem with these days. And this is going to be probably one of the main reasons for the interview today is, is verse number 13. Leviticus 20, 13 is, the, is, is the, the most controversial verse in the Bible in the United States of America today where the Bible says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. I didn't write the book, but I'm going to preach the book. God's attitude towards this hasn't changed. It said in the Old Testament, if a man lie with uh, mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. That means God hates it. God still hates it to this day. And you know what his judgment was on it? The death penalty. It wasn't a prison sentence. It wasn't a fine. It was, you just have to put them to death. When we get to Judges 19, we're going to see uh, some of the, the, the problems with, with um, the Sodomites and, and the judgment of God. That's coming up in the future. Genesis 19, we see where, Lot dest or God, where God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, raining down fire and brimstone from heaven. That's God's judgment. And you can see, read 2 Peter chapter 2, and you'll see that it still is, those stories were written for an example unto us, that those that after would live ungodly, um, let me, you know, I'm quoting it wrong. Let me just read it for you. 2 Peter chapter 2. I don't want to butcher the word of God. But people always want to say, oh, well, that's Old Testament, that's Old Testament. How about something from the New Testament? Well, how about something from the New Testament? Because we don't just throw out the entire Old Testament just because of the time period we live in. The Bible says that all Scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine. All Scripture. All of it. Not just the New Testament, all of it. 
that was spoken in the New Testament. That was an epistle in the New Testament. Scripture that people had during the time of the writing of the New Testament was the Old Testament. I mean, that's what was written and that's what they had received. It is Scripture. He's referring to all Scripture. Now, obviously, we had more writings added that are the Word of God in the New Testament. All of it is profitable. The Bible says here in verse number 6 of 2 Peter chapter 2, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. They were wicked. They were filthy. That's what God, how God describes what was going on in Sodom. And they delivered just Lot. And um, it says here that that was an ensample. That's an example for us to look at and say, hey, anyone that wants to live ungodly like they did, here's how God deals with that. Here's how God feels about that. Yes, in the New Testament, yes, 2 Peter chapter 2 was written after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's pretty New Testament. We could keep reading in Leviticus chapter 20. Verse 14, If a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among, among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and he shall slay the beast. So he starts going in, and, and this starts getting real weird with this. Like, who would even think of doing those things? Why would that even have to be part of God's law? You think, how, why would you even have to write this down? I mean, that's just bizarre. That is just perverted, twisted, weird, disgusting, should make you want to vomit if you ever even heard of someone doing anything like that. Why would he even have to bring this stuff up and mention it? Well, because it says in verse number 22 there in Leviticus chapter 20, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land where I bring you to dwell there and spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. And you can go back and read further on. And he's saying, they did all of these things. So if you ever wondered, why did God bring such a severe judgment upon the people of the Canaan land when he brought the children of Israel in? That's why. Because he was executing more than just one thing. He wasn't just saying, oh, well, I love Israel so much and I just want them to have this land so much that I'm just going to go and wipe out all these people and who cares about them and I'm just going to plant my people here in this land. No. In fact, the Bible teaches that they weren't good enough and if it wasn't for Abraham that he made these promises to, they wouldn't have even gotten it anyways. But see, what God was doing is he was keeping his promise to Abraham and at the same time bringing judgment against a wicked nation. An extremely wicked nation. And you know what? Any nation that wants to walk in this level of wickedness better watch out because the judgment of God is going to come upon them also. Amen. And it's happened all throughout history. And the Bible attributes this to God specifically in Leviticus chapter 20 for the land of Canaan. That's what they did. Let's go back to Judges chapter 3. So these people that did these things were remaining in the land. God wanted them all destroyed. Now, the majority of them were destroyed. They were, you know, they were under tribute. They were, you know, they were not in power at the, at the time when Israel came in and took over the land. But over years, we've got to remember, we're going to be reading through this book and it's going to span like over 400 years. Over 400 years while we're reading this. Even in this one chapter, I mean, we're going through three different judges that it mentions by name. So we're talking about probably a good 100 years of time in one chapter. We're just reading these verses. You know, that's an estimate. It could be 60 years, it could, you know, whatever. But it's, it's still a large time frame in general just over the course of one chapter. But we need to keep this in mind and remember who these people are and they're being left there now to, to see whether or not the children of Israel are going to stay with God or not. 
verse number, uh, where did we leave off here? Verse number six. Well, we we'll read verse number six. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. So this is what starts to happen already. Children of Israel start turning their back on God. They start intermarrying with the heathen, with the wicked people of the land that, that worshiped and served other gods that were doing all these things that we just read. And now they're just joining themselves to them and becoming one people. Not a big deal, right? The Lord their God all of a sudden isn't that important anymore. The Lord their God that, that fought their battles for them. The Lord their God that delivered them from bondage. The Lord their God that, that brought them forth out of Egypt. Not that big of a deal anymore. Why? Because it probably one of the reasons because they had peace for so long. They didn't know war. They didn't know what it was like to struggle. Everything's being handed to them. They got all this great. And even when they were brought into that land, they didn't have to build their houses. I mean, they literally wiped out the people and just took over the land that they were living in. I mean, it's all established for them. They had cities built already and they're just moving in. Verse number seven, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. See, they just forgot all about the Lord. Verse number eight, therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. So as a result of them turning their back on God and worshiping and serving other gods, God gets angry with them. And we saw this in chapter two, twice it mentioned that the, the anger of the Lord, he was hot against them. I mean, he's getting real angry with his children, with his people for turning their back on him. And as a result of that, it says he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim. So this king of Mesopotamia comes in and basically begins ruling over them. He has the power now over the children of Israel. He brings them into tribute and they have to serve under him for eight years. And then it says in verse number nine, and when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Now this is pretty interesting because we see here, we can gather a rough estimate of the time that went by between Joshua's death and the children of Israel already just straying away and marrying the people of the land and, and, and going after other gods. It could not have been that long at all because the man that God raised up to be the deliverer was Othniel. If you remember from Joshua, he was the man that, that married Caleb's daughter. He was the one that, that through the course of them, you know, defeating all these enemies, um, Caleb was like, hey, if you can defeat this, you know, this city, I'll give you my daughter, Aksa, to wife. And Othniel stepped up and he's like, he did it. He did the job and defeated that, those people. And he then was given her daughter to wife. So he was a man of war. He was a valiant man of war. During the time of Joshua, during the time of Caleb, right. how many years could have possibly passed by when after Joshua passed now to all of a sudden these people are, are going into just serving other gods? That's not that long. I mean, 10, 20 years 30 years maybe. I mean, we don't know exactly how old Othniel is, but Othniel still uh, is able to, to rise and, and get this. He can't be that old because it, the Bible says here in um, verse number 11, it says, And the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel the son of Kenaz died. That implies that Othniel was, was being the judge for, an, for another 40 years then. Now, he could, it doesn't say how old he was. He could have lived to be 120 or whatever, like similar to, to how long Joshua lived. But even still, that's not very much time that has passed where all of a sudden now going right back into the world, going right back to the heathen. We need to be reminded of this on a regular basis. Hopefully, you know, now, you know, 
people who are here. This is a great church. We've got a lot of people to help encourage one another and to keep yourself, you know, kind of focused on the right thing. Keep yourself, you know, going and serving the Lord. But maybe there'll come a time where something comes up in your life. You move, you get out of church, something happens. Don't forget because it takes, it doesn't take much time at all for people to fall away from serving God. And to just get off into the world. Even God's own people, believers, can just get off, backslide, get into the world, and just start going down that, that downward spiral of sin and just going off and not really caring and kind of forgetting about the Lord your God. I've seen it happen many, many times. That's why it's so important. It's one of the reasons why it's so important to be in church. Just make sure you make it a priority. Be in God's house. Be among people who are like-minded believers. Get the teaching. Make it an important part of your life. And even if it's not this church, just get in a good church. Someone where the people got the right gospel, where they're serving the Lord, where you're going to get the most out of, out of that church by, by serving, helping one another, as well as just being among other people that love God. That's where you need to be planted. And, and when you start getting away from that and you forget the struggles and you forget the battle, you know what? And be a church that's got the struggles and the battles going on. You know, it's probably the church that's doing something right. Amen. It's, it's ironic how many people will say, oh, you're not being very Christ-like and you're not, you know, the, how many times do you hear that? Oh, well, that's not what you... Well, you know what being Christ-like does? You know what it did to Jesus? It got him crucified. It got a lot of people hating on him. It got a lot of turmoil. And a lot of people were conspiring against him and trying to catch him in his words and trying to set a trap for him and arresting him falsely and beating him up and spitting in his face and nailing him to a cross. Where did he get his disciples? The same thing. Similar things. Believers throughout history. Are they generally received well by the world? No. So you know what? Being Christ-like doesn't equal being loved by the world. Not at all. In fact, it's the opposite. Jesus said if they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more they have his household. The Christian thing to do, what Jesus Christ said, is to proclaim the truth, to preach the word of the Lord without apology, without censorship, unadulterated, thus saith the Lord. It doesn't matter if it offends people. The goal isn't to purposely offend people, but the goal is to teach the word very plainly, thus saith the Lord. You do with that what you will. But just by shining the light and shining the light of the gospel, there's going to be a lot of people that don't like the light. And it's going to bring a lot of people who hate God and hate the Bible and want to shut you down. Nothing has changed in, in that regard. People are the way that they are. Let's keep reading here. In, uh, I, I kind of skipped over some verses, so let's go back up to... Uh, verse number nine, because this I wanted to make this point too. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, so we're going to see this happen again from time to time, all throughout the book. But when the children of Israel cry unto the Lord, then God does help them. He does deliver them. So you know what? Maybe you do get off into sin and you kind of forget about God. Don't forget this. You know, if you get brought down low and you get into a place where like, oh man, I really screwed up like the children of Israel did. What were we thinking? I don't know. They cried unto the Lord. You know what? The Lord heard them. Don't ever be too proud to ask God for help. Confess your sin. Forsake your sin. God, help me. We did wrong. Please help us. God, I, I know I screwed up and I'm being judged. But Lord, please have mercy on me. Help me. And God will hear that prayer. And he did hear. And he sends them a deliverer. He raises up Othniel. Say, okay. So Othniel rises up and, and uh, it says here in verse number 10, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him 
and he judged Israel and went out to war. So this, <laughs> this wasn't in my notes, but I just find this, this funny because, again, with, with the culture that we live in today, what, what do people want to say Christianity? Oh, don't judge. Don't be a judge. Well, what happens here? The Spirit of God comes upon a man, and what does he do? He judges. <laughs> oh, wait, and, and guess what? Our Bible study is called the Book of Judges. <laughs> I, I think there is some element of judging that, that can be righteous judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And we, when we read Matthew chapter 7, don't stop after reading two words that says judge not. Well, you just read the rest of the chapter and get the whole thing in context and you'll see that it says judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. It's a warning against judging as a hypocrite saying, oh yeah, don't do this and that's wicked and that's a sin and then going around and doing those very things because you know what? God's going to bring that judgment upon you and I preached on this on Sunday. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon. We have a prime example of that happening. And that's exactly what that's about. It doesn't mean you can't preach the Bible it doesn't mean you can't tell other people, well, this is God's judgment. You know, when we go out and try to preach people the gospel and explain to them, hey, look, you're a sinner, you deserve hell, and just show what the Bible says, oh, don't judge me. Well, look, I'm not even the one judging you. It's God's judgment. I'm not, I don't send anybody to hell. I'm not going to be there going, aha, you're going into hell, sinner. I'm just trying to point out the facts that God has a law and you've broken those laws. I've broken those laws. We've all broken those laws, which is why we all need a Savior, which is why we all need to put our faith in our, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But just by doing that, it's not, you know, it is a judgment, but it's not my judgment. God's already given us his judgment. Our job is just to, to preach it. Shout it from the rooftops is what Jesus taught. He didn't say hide it under a bushel. He didn't say, get, get embarrassed because someone's offended and I don't want to say anything. You don't want to preach the gospel to people. You don't want to preach the word, then according to the Bible, you don't even love those people. You can be polite and never bring up religion because that's taboo. And you can be polite and, send, and, and, and hold that person's hand all the way until they die and go to hell. That doesn't sound very loving to me. Or you can tactfully bring up the gospel and lovingly try to instruct someone and show them, hey, and at least give them a chance. And if they reject that, that's on them. But at least you love them enough to, to say, hey, I don't want you going to that place. Here's how you can avoid it. And that's the whole point. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathaim, and the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So for eight years they're being judged, and then after Othniel is raised up by the Lord, they experience 40 more years of peace. So things growing well again. Let's read here, verse number 12. It says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. Now, I covered this in, in the book of Joshua, but, but we can, um, I'm not going to go there tonight for sake of time. But the city of palm trees is Jericho. And I think this is interesting. Now, we didn't see in the previous verses that any of their cities had been taken by a foreign entity. They did come under the, the control of a foreign entity, but it doesn't say that they actually lost like one of their cities to a foreign government, to a foreign entity. But here we're seeing now that the very first place where they wrought a victory, the city of Jericho, here the city of palm trees was referenced, that they've lost that. They possess the, the city of palm trees. It's Ammon and Amalek. 
went and smote Israel. Verse number 14, so the children of Israel served Eagle on the king of Moab 18 years. So now the second time around, now they're serving a little bit more time. They're being punished a little bit harder. First time it was eight years being judged for, for getting into wickedness and, and serving other gods. They get brought back again. They're good for four years. And now they're, they're straying off again. Now it's okay. Now it's 18 years. You know, think about your own kids. You know, you discipline them the first time for something. Maybe, you know, they should have known better, but they did it. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to give them a, a discipline. We're going to punish them. Then they turn around and do it again. And now it's going to be a little bit harder the next time. Now, obviously, you know, with your kids, you're not waiting 40 years in between these, these events. But 40 years is still, I mean, what is that, one or two, one or two generations? It's not that long. Or still, everybody is still around. There's a lot of people still around from the first time. It's not like it's totally brand new and everybody's just, just didn't know that whole 40-year reign of, uh, of Othniel and in, in kind of leading them in the Lord. But we're going to see that, that these, these punishments are going to increase. Verse number 15, But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. So they cry out again, and God hears them again. And this shows the long-suffering and merciness, the mercy of God is that he's going to continue to hear them when they, when they fall and when they backslide and then want to get right with God. It says, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So here we see Ehud is this new judge that's going to be raised up this deliverer. And what the Bible is telling us here is that the children of Israel were sending him, they're, they're using him to send a present unto the king, unto Eglon. The children of Israel, I don't think, were instructing him to go and kill Eglon. But Ehud, being the, the deliverer that God was raising up, he's the one who decided. That's why he hid this dagger, right? He makes this dagger he puts it on his right thigh. It says he, he covered it. It was underneath his raiment. It was under his clothing. So he's kind of concealing a weapon. He's concealed carry, right? And he's walking in to deliver this great present unto the king because they're under tribute. So they're sending this guy and saying, okay, we want to keep this guy happy. He's, you know, ruling over us. So they send, um, they send Ehud to go deliver this present. And it's telling us already, well, he had made a dagger, had two edges of a cubit length. A cubit is basically the distance. It's about one and a half feet, but from your, your forearm to your, to your fingers, is that's the length of a cubit approximately. So it's a pretty long dagger. I mean, I think of a dagger, I think of something a lot smaller. But this is like, this is like a small sword. And there's a reason why he's given us the length of this. Because later on, he's going he's gonna to stab it at him, and the whole thing goes in and doesn't come back out again. And uh, we'll get to that here in just a minute because it says in verse number 17, and he brought the present on Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. Now, you're like, why, why do we care? Why does this matter? Or why is this even in scripture? Well, one, it's telling, when it says he's a very fat man, and then we read that when he, when he stabs him with a dagger, that the whole thing goes in and it says that, that, that his, this, the fat like encloses around the blade of the dagger, like, or the, the handle, and he can't even pull it back out again. He was a very large man. And, and I mean, think about this length going in, like inside of someone and kind of losing that in there. He was a big guy. Now, that's a very gluttonous person. This is someone who's, who's given over to gluttony. I realize there's people that have problems with maintaining their weight for, for physical reasons, but I don't think that that's the reason why God has this in the scripture. And notice you tie this in, this leader, this king, that was this very fat man, his, uh, his people, his servants, the, the people that they slew, it says in verse number 29, if you want to jump down to verse number 29, it says, and they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So they were very, you know, they were courageous, they were fighters, but they're all lusty men. And it's that lusty personality, that lusty man that's going to be given over to their appetite, to their carnal belly and the things of the flesh become very lusty and just giving themselves over into whatever. 
whether it be fornication or drinking or food and just having this, this lusty appetite and just consuming all that upon yourself. Um, I mean, just, just uh, at its core, it's a, it's a, it's a very selfish mindset to have. You're just kind of thinking about your own pleasure and you're kind of in bondage to your own flesh when you get to that point. But let's, let's read here. Every, you know, I, I was kind of bringing up a lot here. Let's, let's get all the verses here in context. Verse number 18, And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. So I don't know what the present was. It must have been pretty big because there's the people who were carrying it who bear the present. He's like, he sends them off. And then it says, But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. So he's like, hey, I got, I got a secret. I'm on a secret mission for you. So the king sends everybody out. So there's nobody left. And now uh, the, these two are left alone. Verse 20, it says, And he had came unto him. And he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ead said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat. So he's like, I've got this special message. I've got a message from God for you. And you know what he did? He did have a message from God. God is the one who raised him up to be a deliverer, to deliver the children of Israel from the bondage of this wicked king. And he had put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft, that's like the handle part, also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and the dirt came out. And you say, what are you telling me the dirt? Well, there's many instances in the Bible, there's a few instances at least. The Bible's not a very, tries to, you know, God's not very graphic on certain things and there's oftentimes euphemisms or idioms are used to explain something without going into too much detail what he's talking about. But that dirt there, it's not talking about literal dirt like that you'd find on the ground. It's because he stabbed him in the gut and he, and he pierced the part of your guts that hold the waist, and his waist came out uh, when that happened. And it says here in verse number 23, Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. So he kind of just backs on out of there, closes the door, and walks away as if nothing happened. Because remember, they were private. They were all by himself. And this is the king. So he, was he had other guards and other people in the, t in the palace with him. But they were left in a private situation in this little room, this little parlor uh, that was kind of private. He closes the doors. And then it says in verse 24, when he was gone out, his servants came. And when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. And they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore, they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. So they're kind of waiting there. They're saying, okay, well, surely you cover this feet. Now, there's, as far as I understand, there's two different opinions on what that means about covering your feet. Now, I'm just going to say right now, I don't think this is some super important doctrine, right, that you need to divide over about what the meaning of covering his feet means. I'm going to tell you what I think it means. I think it means that he was, well, we, you know, like using the restroom, right? Dropped his drawers to go and relieve himself. And I think that's also why it mentioned that the dirt came out because it probably stunk a little bit. And these, these men were, were waiting outside. He's like, oh, the door's locked. We're going to give him his privacy in there so he could use the restroom. But then after a while, they're just like, when's this guy ever going to be done? You know, until they were ashamed. And then that's when they decide to open up the doors and they find him dead. And by that time, Ead was able to escape already. There's only one other place where this is mentioned. And that's what I think that that term means. I think it's pretty straightforward. Some people think that it means to cover your feet means to, to take a nap, like to go to sleep, and you'd cover your feet with a blanket or something. I don't think that that makes as much sense. The only other place where this is mentioned is in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. You can turn there if you'd like. But the Bible says there, that's when Saul was chasing after David and he enters into a cave to cover his feet. 
That's it. I'll just read it for you. First Samuel 24 verse two says, then Saul took 3000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave and Saul went in to cover his feet and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. So David and his men are, they're hiding in this cave from Saul and all the people are following him. And all of a sudden Saul walks in, right? So they're, they're just, they're back in this cave and they're trying to keep quiet. And it says there in verse four, and the men of David said unto him, behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Now, this isn't a skirt that we would think of today, like where women wear skirts. A skirt is just a lower portion of a garment. It could literally be the lower portion of any type of garment. The skirt is that, that, uh, that bottom portion. So it says here, it was the skirt of his robe. So he was obviously wearing a robe and it's the skirt or the lower portion of that robe. It's not that he was wearing a skirt, even though it says he cut off Saul's skirt. That's, it doesn't take much reading comprehension to see what he's talking about there. But, um, and people say, oh, he was just going in and take a nap. You know, if you believe that, I, I don't care. I don't think it makes really that big of a deal one way or the other. I think it just makes sense that he could have a little bit of privacy inside of this cave and he was going in there to do this. And, um, and that's what happened. So those are the only two places. I just kind of wanted to bring that up because there are people I think that teach differently on that. But um, either way, I don't think that's some um, major doctrine, but I, I'm telling you what I believe about that. You come to your own opinion about that. And then in verse uh, 26, we see, and he had escaped while they tarried and passed by on the quarries and escaped on the Sirath. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. And he said unto them, follow after me for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. And another thing that we're going to see over and over again is just the importance of having a strong leader, someone that can rally the troops, someone that can lead the charge. You have, you could have a lot of people who kind of believe a certain way, but you need to be mobilized. They need to be put into force. That's why the Bible says in Romans 10, even with just with preaching the gospel, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they hear, or how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? <coughs> By and large, you're not finding individual believers in Jesus Christ just going off on their own and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know we're going to find them. You're going to find them in church. You're going to find them under the leadership of someone who's saying, hey, we've got a soul winning time. We're going out. We're preaching the gospel today. Let's all come together and do this work. That's where you find the people evangelizing. It's under that type of leadership and direction. And obviously I'm applying that to church, but we're going to see even just, just in any sense, you know, in general, you know, Jesus Christ refers to people as being sheep. And I don't think it's necessarily in a derogatory way. I mean, he's just saying, hey, my people hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice because he's the great shepherd. And that's how God made human beings in general. The, the creatures that we are, we have a tendency to need a leader, someone to kind of lead us around and guide us and help us out. And, and that's, that's our nature. You know, science, will t even, even people who don't believe in God will tell you that that's part of human nature. I mean, sociologists, psychologists, you could do, you know, that's just who we are. That's how God made us. And it's a fact of life. And we see that over and over again, when you've got a strong leader in charge, especially one that wants to serve the Lord, then a lot of great things can happen and can help lead a large people from doing wickedness and getting into sin. Why is that important? Because when the people all get into sin, God's going to judge those people. But if, if a, a great leader can rise up and say, hey, we're going to follow the Lord. We're going to serve God. Let's all, let's all respect God's word. Let's exalt God's word. Let's make the Lord our God. And God's going to bless that people. No matter who they are. No matter where you live. 
God's going to bless those people who call the Lord their God and serve him. Verse number 29, we'll finish up the chapter here, we're almost done. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. So now instead of 40 years, now they have rest for 80 years. All right, they were in bondage a little bit longer, but now they're going to rest for even longer. They've had 80 years of rest. And then verse 31 says, And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Now, we don't hear a lot about him, unfortunately, but I think that's a pretty interesting little tidbit there. And I don't really have anything to preach on this last verse, but um, he takes an ox goat and he's able to kill 600 men because the Spirit of God is upon him. Just, and we're going to see that throughout the book of Judges when the Spirit of God comes upon the leader, that they're able to do great things, mighty things, things that you normally wouldn't expect someone to be able to do. All right, let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for all the things that we can learn in these stories. God, I pray that you would please just um, bless everyone here tonight. Help us all to, to learn and understand more. God, we love you. We want to serve you. Help us to do so in sincerity and in truth and in the right spirit. Lord, I pray that, that um, our words wouldn't be twisted out of context but that the message that we're trying to get across, your message, the message of Scripture, of the Bible, of your love and of your judgment, will all be, um, be able to be put out to the masses, dear Lord, and that I pray that, that there would be a revival of people who love you and want to serve you, getting into good churches and, um, and just proclaiming the word of the Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.